At last we meet again. Hi, hello. How is everyone on this rather lovely um Thursday? <laughs> rather lovely Thursday. I hope you guys are ready to read. Um books. Though I guess I'll be reading, but listen to books, huh? Why don't we change this on over to uh something a little more relaxing? Shall we? Give me a second here. I will find something. Also, hello, nuclear nachos. <laughs> you grand leader. Ah. Oops, that's the wrong thing. Uh -huh. um, Let me update this real quick. My day, my day was, um, like, alright. <laughs> it was, once again, a slow day. But, you know, today, I'm not complaining because it was a small rush, but it wasn't enough to ruin my day. Uh, hold on. <laughs> I'm gonna mute the video real quick. How about you? How was your day? How was your guys' day in general? Oh. Ooh, let's go with that song. What? <laughs> Excuse me. Oh. Okay. There we go. Ooh, but eleven packs of concrete. Oh, your fence is coming along nice and nice, I assume. Mm -hmm. That's gotta be the only thing, right? I remember you telling me about that fence. Or maybe that was the doghouse, but whatever the case, it's coming along nicely. No, oh, <laughs> you just gotta, um, you just gotta trick up oh, somehow. Yes. Uh, hold on. There we go. Okay. Ready? <laughs> I don't know, I still feel like this song, this BGM doesn't quite match. Hmm. I, let me find something a little more down to earth. I don't exactly have anything. You know what? <laughs> Why not? Why not that one? Instead, I mean. There we go. Much more relaxing. So, sit down and... Let's enjoy some story time, shall we? But before we do that, <laughs> I insist on... I insist on reading Fox and Socks again. <laughs> I insist on reading Fox and Socks again. Just to start us off. Yes? Mm-mm. <laughs> Ooh. 
Ooh, shrimp pasta. Fancy. Very, very fancy. Mmm. I had, um, grilled chicken with, uh, mac and cheese and a, and a side of, uh, uh, mashed potatoes. No gravies. I'm not exactly a gravy guy. <laughs> Why enjoy the, uh, mashed potatoes if you can't you know i mean the gravy but if you can't enjoy the mashed potatoes alone that's the good stuff anyways you guys ready box and socks okay box box and socks by dr seuss box socks box knocks and no i can't rap like with this so i'm not even gonna try Knox and Fox, Fox and Socks. Knox and Fox and Socks and Box. Fox and Socks on Box on Knox. Chicks with bricks come, chicks with blocks come. Chicks with bricks and blocks and clocks come. Sir, look, sir, Mr. Knox, sir. Let's do tricks with bricks and blocks, sir. Let's do tricks with chicks and clocks, sir. First, I'll make a quick trick brick stack. Then, I'll make a quick trick block stack. You can make a quick trick chick stack. You can make a quick trick clock stack. Here's a new trick, Mr. Knox. Socks on chicks and chicks on clocks. Locks on clocks on bricks and blocks. Bricks and blocks on Knox. On box. Now, now, now we come to say ticks and talks, sir. Try to say this, Mr. Knox, sir. Clocks on fox. Tick clocks on Knox. Tick tock. Six sick bricks tick. Six sick chicks talk. Please, sir, I don't like this trick, sir. My tongue isn't quite, isn't quick or slick, sir. I get all those, all those ticks with and clocks, sir. Mix up the chicks and talk, sir. I can't do it, Mr. Fox, sir. I'm so sorry, Mr. Knox, sir. It's an easy game to play. It's an easy thing to say. Like socks, two socks, who socks, who socks? Who sues, who socks, who sues, who socks? Who sees who sue who's new socks, sir? We see sue sue sue's new socks, sir. That's not easy, Mr. Fox, sir. Who comes? Crow comes. Slow Joe Crow comes. Who sews crow's clothes? Sue sews crow's clothes. Slow Joe Crow sues who's clothes? Sue's clothes. <laughs> sue sue's socks of socks and socks now. Snow Joe Crow sues Knox and Box now. Sue sews Sue Sue sues Crow's on Slow Joe Crow's clothes. Box sues hose Sue sews Sue's hose on Slow Joe's Crow's nose. Box goes Rose Crow's nose hose goes some. Crow's Rose Crow's some. Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox, I hate this game. My, this game makes my tongue quite lame, sir. Mr. Knox, sir, what a shame, sir. We'll find something new to do now. Here's lots of new blue goo now. New goo, blue goo. Gooey goo. Blue goo, new goo, gluey glue. Gooey goo for chewing, chewing. Chewy chewing. That's what goo goosing is doing. <laughs> it really has. <sighs> do you choose to chew Goo too, sir. If sir, you sir, choose to choose, sir. The goo goose chew, sir, do, sir. Mr. Fox, sir, I won't say, do it. I can't say it. I won't chew it. Very well, sir. Step this way, we'll find another game to play. Bim comes, Ben comes. Bim brings Ben broom. Ben brings Bim broom. Ben bends, brims broom. Ben, Bim bends, bends broom. Bim's bends, bends, bends. Ben's bent, broom breaks. Bim's bent, broom breaks. Ben's band, Bim's band. Big bands, big bands. Bim, Bim and Ben lead bands with brooms. Ben's band bangs and Bim's band booms. Big band, boom band. Big band, broom band. Poor mouth can't say that, no sir. My poor mouth can't say that, no sir. My poor mouth is much too slow, sir. Well then, bring your mouth this way, we'll find it. Find it something I can say. Look like... Let me try to read this faster. <laughs> Look like likes likes. Looks ducks likes likes. Looks luck like licks likes. Looks ducks likes likes. Duck takes likes and locks look like likes likes. 
Look like takes licks and duck licks and in like duck duck licks. I can't blabber some such blubber blubber. My tongue isn't made of rubber. Mr. Knox, now come on, come now. Now come now. Come now. You don't have to be so dumb now. Try to say this, Mr. Knox, please. Three cheese. Two, two, three cheese. Cheese, three, three, fleas flew. While these fleas flew, frenzy breeze blew. Breezy breeze made these three trees freeze. Breezy trees made these trees cheese freeze. That's what made these three, three, three fleas sneeze. Stop it, stop it. That's enough, sir. I can't say such silly stuff, sir. Very much well then, Mr. Knox, sir. So let's we'll, we'll talk about Tweedle Beetles. Do you know about Tweedle Beetles? Wow. When Tweedle Beetles fight, it's called a Tweedle Beetle battle. And when they battle and puddle, it's called a Tweedle Beetle puddle battle. And when they, when they, when Tweedle Beetles battle with pud, paddles in the puddle, they call it a Tweedle Beetle puddle paddle battle. And when Beetles battle Beetles in the puddle paddle battle, and a Beetle battle puddle is a puddle in a bottle. They call it a Tweedle Beetle bottle battle. Puddle paddle battle muddle. And when beetles fight these battles in a bottle with the paddles, the bottles in a poodle and the poodles eating noodles, they call us a muddle puddle tweedle poodle beetle battle beetle noodle bottle paddle battle. And now wait a minute, Mr. Sox. Fox? When a fox is in the bottle, with a tweedle beetles battle with their paddles in a bottle and a, a noodle eating poodle, this is what they call. A tweet a beat a noodle poodle bottled paddled muddled duddled bottled waddled fox and socks sir fox and socks our game is done sir thank you for a lot of fun sir <laughs> this sucks <laughs> I'll, I'll get it one day trust me i'll get it one day mm -hmm. not today but some some other day it's very long isn't it i don't remember the book being this long when I was was younger, I could have sworn it was like ten pages or so, something like that. But I, I guess not. Oh well. <laughs> that was Fox and Socks by Dr. Seuss. Now then, I have another rhyme, but we're not gonna read that one. Oh no! Instead, we're gonna read. I want my hat back. <laughs> I did this one on stream before. I don't know if anyone remembers it, but I feel like doing it again. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I want my hat back by John Classen. My hat is gone. I want it back. Have you seen my hat? No, I haven't seen your hat. Okay. Thank you anyway. Have you seen my hat? I have not seen any hats around here. Okay. Thank you anyway. Have you seen my hat? No. Why are you asking me? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any hats anywhere. I would not steal a hat. Don't ask me any more questions. Okay. Thank you anyway. <laughs> have you seen my hat? I haven't seen anything all day. I've been trying to climb this rock. Would you like me to lift you up on top of it? Yes, please. Have you seen my hat? I saw a hat once. It was round. It was blue and round. My hat doesn't look like that. Thank you anyway. Have you seen my hat? What is a hat? Ah, <sighs> thank you anyway. Nobody has seen my hat. What if I never see it again? What if no one ever finds it? My poor hat. I miss it so much. What's the matter? I have lost my hat. Nobody has seen it. What does your hat look like? It's red and pointy and... I have seen my hat. As he runs along the field. <laughs> Way past the animals he passed. You! You stole my hat. And he... Aggressively looks at the bunny with his pointy hat. I love my hat. <laughs> uh, Hona, 
Hi. <laughs> Thank you for the follow. Mm -mm -mm. How you doing? Anyways, that was, uh... <laughs> oh, there is more. Excuse me, have you seen a rabbit wearing a hat? No. Why are you asking me? I haven't seen them. I haven't seen any rabbits anywhere. I would not eat a rabbit. Don't ask me any more questions. Okay. But thank you anyway. Oh, wow, this book is darker than I remember. <laughs> I don't remember the bear eating the rabbit. Hmm. Interesting. Very, very interesting. I, <laughs> I really don't remember the bear eating the rabbit. Hmm. Oh, all right, right, right. <laughs> I'm glad you get, you're able to catch this stream. Mm -hmm. We're just reading some random stories. Uh. <laughs> and that was. Have you seen. Oh, where is my hat? Mm. Ready for another Dr. Seuss one? Yeah? Okay. Here it goes. And this one I'm reading next is One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. I'm sure you know this is a book. <laughs> Oops. Excuse me. I'm sure you guys, most, most of you guys know this book, but let's see here. One fish, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, black fish, blue fish, old fish, new fish. This one has a little card, this one has a little star. Say what a lot of fish there are. Yes, some are red and some are blue, some are old and some are new. Some are sad and some are glad, and some are very, very bad. Why are you sad and glad and bad? I do not know. Go ask your dad. Some are thin and some are fat. The fat one has a yellow hat. From there to here, from here to there. Funny things are everywhere. Here are some who like to run. They run for fun in the hot sun. Oh me, oh my, oh me, oh my. What a lot of fun things to go by. Some have two feet, and some have four. Some have, some have six feet. Some have more. Where do you, they come from? I can't say. But I bet they have a come a long, long way. We, cut, we see them come, we see them go. Some are fast, some are slow. Some are high, some are low. Not one of them is like another. Do not ask us why. Go ask your mother. Hey, look at his fingers. One, two, three. How many fingers do you see? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He has eleven. Eleven. This is something new. I wish I had eleven too. Bump, bump, bump. Do you ever ride a wump? We have a wump with just one hump. But we call we know a man called Mr. Gump. Mr. Man has a seven hump wump so he likes to go bump bump just jump on the hump of the wump of the wump of gump who am i my name is ned i do not like my little bed this is no good this is not right my feet stick out of the bed and all night and when i pull them in oh dear my head sticks out of bed up here we like we like our bike it's made of green our mic sits up back and back you see we like our mike and this is why mike does all the work when the hill gets high wow hello there ned how do you do tell me tell me what is new how are things in your little bed what is new please tell me ned i do not like this bed at all a lot of things have come to call a cow a dog a cat a mouse oh, what a bed oh, what a house <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear, I cannot hear. Would you please come over near? Will you please look in my ear? There must be something I fear. Say, look, the bird was in your ear, but he is out, so have no fear. Again, your ear can hear, my dear. My hat is old, my teeth are gold. I have a bird I'd like to hold. My shoe is off, my foot is cold. My shoe is off, my foot is cold. A bird I like to hold. My hat is old. My teeth are gold. And now my story is all told. 
We took a look, we saw a nook. On his head, he had a hook. On his hook, he had a book. And on his book, he was how to cook. We saw him sit and try to cook. But a nook he can't read, so a nook can't cook. So, what good to a nook is a hook cook book? Anyways, the moon was out and we saw some sheep. We saw some sheep take a walk in their sleep. By the light of the moon, by the light of a star, we walked all night from near to far. And would never walk, I would take a car. I do not like this one so well. All he does is yow, yow, yow. I would not have this one about. When he comes in, I put him out. This one is quiet as a mouse. I like to have him in the house. At our house, we, we open cans. We have to open many cans. That is why we have a Zans. What's a Zans? A Zans for cans is very good. You can have a Zans for cans. You should. I like to box. Oh, I like to box. So every day, I box a gox. In yellow socks, I box my gox. I box in yellow gox box socks. It is fun to sing if you sing with a ying. My ying can sing like anything. I sing high and my ying sing low. We are not too bad, you know. One thing, this one I think is called a yink. He likes to wink, he likes to drink. He likes to drink and drink and drink. The thing he likes to drink is ink. The ink he likes to drink is pink. He likes to wink and drink pink ink. So, we have a lot of ink. You should get a ink, a yink, I think. <laughs> this is also a lot longer than I remember. Hop, hop, hop. I am a yap. All I do is hop from fingertip to fingertip. I hop from left to right and then hop, hop. I hop right back again. I like to hop all day and night. Right to left and left to right. Why do I hop, hop? I do not know. Go ask your pop. Brush, brush, brush. There's a lot. <laughs> you guys really want me to finish this? I, I can. <laughs> Oh boy. Brush, 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 brush. Comb, 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 comb. Blue hair is fun to brush and comb. All, bl all girls who like to brush and comb should have, have a pet like this at home. <laughs> what is this pet saying? He is wet. You never, you never yet met a pet, I bet. As wet as they let this wet pet get. Did you ever fly a kite in bed? Did you ever... Walk with ten cats in, on your head. Did you ever milk this kind of cow? Well, you can do it. We should. We know how. If you ever, never did, you should. These things are fun, and fun is good. Hello, hello, are you there? Hello. I called you up to say hello. I said hello. Can you hear me, Joe? Oh no, I cannot hear your call. I cannot hear you at all. This is not good, and I know why. Must cut the wire. Goodbye. From near to far, from here to there. Funny things are everywhere. These yellow pets are called the Zeds. They have one hair upon their heads. Their hair grows so fast. So fast, they say. They need a haircut. Every day. Oh my. My name is Ish. On my hand, I have a dish. I have this dish to help me wish when I wish to make a wish. I wave my hand in big swish wish. Then I say I wish for fish. Then I get fish right on my dish. So, if you wish to make a wish, you may wish for fish on my wish, wish dish. Oh, you guys think so? I'm glad. <laughs> At our house, we play out back. We play a game called Ring and Gag. Ring the Gag. Would you like to play this game? Come down. We, only, we have the only gag in town. Look what we found in the park in the dark. We will take him home. We call him. We will call him Clark. He will live at our house, grow and grow. Will our mother like this? No. And last but not least. And now, good night. It is time to sleep. So, we will sleep with our pet Zeep. Today is gone. Today was fun. Tomorrow is another day. Every day from here to there, funny things are everywhere. <laughs> Well, there you go. There was one fish, two fish. Mm. I'm glad you guys are enjoying this. I, 
I honestly just wanted to read some random books. <laughs> now, did you guys want to continue with the, the children's book? Or do you guys want to go to, uh, the horror stories? Mm -hmm. Take a pick. Because I can do either, right? Either or. Because I can also do... What's it? Um... Horror stories, huh? Well, should we change the tune? I don't think I have a scary song. Or BGM. Hmm. Done. Nope. <laughs> no! Not that song. Sorry, I'm... Mm -hmm. Got it. You know what we'll do? Hush no BGM. We'll do this. Um... We will do... Let's turn down the mood, shall we? Alright. Let's see. Let's see. Come on, creepy pasta. Why not, right? Welcome to Hell's Library. Shall we get started? Rolag, the librarian. I'll confess, it's been very difficult for me to write this account. As I finally reveal my family's dark secret to the world. A few years ago, I would have never have considered going public with the, twi the twisted collection that I inherited. Painstakingly must maintain and added for two for all of my life. And to do so, an internet forum. I despise the World Wide Web and electronic books. Those soulless digital documents are slowly strangling life out of this business. I've devoted my existence to vintage titles, living for the smell of leather, the bindings and sorties to obscure bookshops. And fierce in all corners of the world. As calling has dominated my life so completely that I've isolated myself from the outside world. I have no friends outside of my professional contacts. I never married or had children. And all my family members are now deceased. I'm the last in my line and soon to have nobody believe my rare collection to after I die. Where am I? No museum or library on the planet would wish to take out my back catalog, and I'm unwilling to put my family's collection for sale. Oh, I know. There are those who would pay anything to acquire certain books in my catalog, but these nefarious characters will never get their claws on my volumes. Honestly, I've come to detest my lifelong role as custodian of this devilish collection. And so, I intend to burn several of my once cherished books before I take my last breath. Frankly, 
Many of these texts shouldn't have never have fallen into mortal hands. So, it's best to turn to the fire once they came. But I digress. It's not my intention to tell my life story, in which, which in any case would be of little interest to anybody on here. However, I feel it's necessary to reveal something my family's dark history to provide context for the tales to come. Our most unusual collection was started by my great-grandfather sometime in the late 1800s. I know little about my ancestor other than he was an unsavory he was the unsavory youngest son of an English duke known for his wild and hedonistic ways. My ancestor was said to have a fling, a young serving girl who subsequently got pregnant. His father made discreet arrangements, forcing the girl to visit a backstreet arbanist. She didn't survive the procedure, however. My great-grandfather was sent away in disgrace, receiving a comfortable allowance from his father the condition that he never darkened the family's doors again. In the years that followed, my ancestor's life took an even darker turn as he indulged himself in a self-destructive binge of alcoholism, womanizing, and ultimately an opium addiction that would be the death of him. It was at that at some point during his downward spiral that my grandfather great-grandfather developed yet another unhealthy and dangerous obsession. This one, being in the cult. I don't know which book he acquired first, or where he found it. But the story is that my ancestor was seeking to make a Boston-type deal with the devil, trading his soul in exchange for earthly pleasures. I doubt he succeeded in his ill-advised venture, but... That's how it started. His hellish collection grew in the years before his death as he acquired rare, often banned works, occult rituals, and paranormal occurrences, originating from all quarters of the globe. And between his book hunts and opium binges, my great grandfather got yet another girl pregnant, became father to a son. I understand he played a little, little to no role my grandfather's upbringing, but he did write a will. But all the wretched man had left to be grief upon his ultimate, untimely death was his damned book collection. And so, the tradition continued. Although, frankly, it's more like a curse our family has had to live with for, well, over a century. You might ask, this hideous custom has been passed down for four, through four generations. Wow. Uh, this one's not that scary, is it? Well, that's a difficult answer to question. I, I'm, I'm switching. Okay. <laughs> that, that one it took too long to build up. Anyway. How about this one? Hmm? This one is called... The Kitchen Drawer Rated 9.3 out of 10 Let's see Dear Thomas You know, know this I love you brother I'm not sure what you will find waiting for You on the kitchen counter beside this notebook Hopefully Nothing But It wouldn't hurt to check the floor to make sure a finger or two Hasn't rolled under the counter you and I just hung up the phone, and you're on your way here. This gives me enough time to write this letter and finish what I started. I want you, hurt. I want you to understand. I, I only threatened to burn this place down with me. It's down me, with me inside it to force you to come. It's the only way I could get you to leave the city and drive to the farmhouse. You would have thought I was mad if I told you over the phone. That I solved the mystery as to why no one has ever found mom's body. The answer lies within the kitchen drawer. Of course, I'll be gone too by the time you get here. 
I'd say goodbye in person, but for me, I accept my current physical state as a steady process of my own doing over the past 24 hours. For you, seeing me, or should I say, what's left of me, would be a frightful shock. As you know, Caro and the kids moved in with her new boyfriend last year. You, what you don't know is that my life has, been, has spiraled downward ever since. Or maybe it started long before her, her affair did. She says I drove her and the kids away. Probably true. The ones we're closest to always sees us, crashing long, before we even realize there's, we're in a, in a tailspin. Not long after they left, I lost my job. Stopped paying my bills, stopped socializing. Regrettably, even with you, I stopped everything. Well, not everything. The bottle has become my companion. I guess I'm more like that than I ever wanted to be. So of course, I was drinking when Carol showed up my, at my apartment. The man demanded that I signed the divorce papers. That didn't go well at all. The bottle made sure of, made sure of that. So I fled. And came here. As far as I can tell, no one, hasn't been, no one has been inside since we were removed and placed in the boys' home. Sad to think that this house never got a second chance of having a happy family. As bleak as our childhood was, I still pictured our home in the fair condition mom kept it during her youth. So, when I arrived here two days ago, I was dismayed to see how dis discrepant they had become. Weather damage and the corrosion of time plagued the roof and wooden frame, making it look sickly. In fact, the surrounding neighborhood looks so bad, looks bad, as if the atrocity spread from our house affected the whole town. As you can see, the inside is worse. No electricity, no water. The mold and the stench of abandonment pollutes the air. The wooden floors are rotted, the painted walls are chipped, the wallpapers the wallpapers one are peeling. I didn't look around much since there isn't a lot I want to reminisce about. Though, drunk as I was, my purpose was unclouded. I entered the kitchen, littered with rat turds and cobwebs. I was almost disappointed to find the outside of the kitchen drawer decayed with its steel handled rusted. Ever. I did get the shock I was expecting when I opened the drawer. Empty, cleaned, unchanged with time. Look for yourself, Saint Thomas. I warn you. Do not put anything in the drawer. Not yet. With great curiosity, I examined the drawer. First, I tried to take it out by sliding it along its trunks. But the drawer does not want to come out. Then, I felt along the inside of the cabinet, and every inch of it was sturdy and smooth. I looked closely at the metal wheels and slides and found them shiny and unscathed. So, it makes no sense that the drawer was irremovable, and even more illogical that it should be in such great condition after two decades. Where did the music go? Anyways, the two decades of neglect. Then again, as you might recall, this drawer does have a history. Mon won't always complain that the drawer was too big, too deep, to, yeah, too, yeah, to keep papers in. Nevertheless, it came the one place in the house where she and Dad put all kinds of stuff. And it was mom who used to say that the drawer ate the stuffing. Bills, letters, pens, and pencils. Whenever dad was furious about a bill or anything with pen pertinent. Information getting lost. Mom would swear that she put it in the drawer. And now it's gone. Dad would beat her. Later on, she would tell us that the drawer ate whatever she got. Ate whatever she got punished for losing. We'd agree. But how awful it must have been for mom to feel patronized by her own children. 
with nursing black eyes and swollen lips. Pardon your heart, dear brother, for you must read the words you have never permitted me to speak in person. In respecting your wishes, I have kept a dark secret that not even Carol, nor the police who inter interrogated us that night are privy to. For on the night that Dad killed Mom, I saw the drawer eat something. Dad and the bottle were hanging out all day when someone came up the farmhouse gave him an envelope. You and Mom were upstairs. The man drove away and Dad opened the envelope right in front of me. Since we were always poor, my eyes might, must have opened as wide as Dad's at the sight of all that cash. It was the first time I saw two things. $100 bills and Dad's smile. He was jubilant as he counted $5,000 out loud. Keep in mind, it wasn't a shared moment between us. Oh, this wasn't a shared moment between us. <laughs> I was a witness. He was too drunk to see me sitting in the corner of the table, doing my homework. I watched him tuck the cash behind, back inside the envelope, go over to the kitchen cabinet. He opened the drawer, put it inside, and closed it. And then, he went back to the living room to share the news with the bottle and call someone on the house phone. Mom came downstairs and started doing dishes. I swear to you, brother, she did not open that drawer. But, when Dad hung up the phone and returned to the kitchen, the first thing he did was open it. His face said, said it all. The rage was like a switch that he, he had been flipped on. Dad threw everything out of the drawer until there was nothing left. He accused her of stealing his money. He didn't have a clue as to what he was talking about. Dad didn't stop him from hurting her. Eventually, Dad noticed me. I suffered a few blows. As I was also forced to deny stealing his money, he sent me up to my room. And there I stayed like a coward, as mom fought to her last breath. I've always admired you for sneaking out of your bedroom window, going to the neighbors and calling the police. I'm glad dad got caught, literally red-handed, blood all over himself, and the saw he used to presumably dismember him, and blood all over the kitchen, everywhere except inside the drawer. The cop said it was as if. Dad had a plastic bag in that drawer. He kept putting body parts in. They could never determine where the bodies, body parts went from there. Mom was gone. Every single part of her. Only the stain of the crime remained, which is sadly iconic. Because she hated a messy kitchen. Mom would have cringed at the notion, notion, notion of one day being reduced to a blood stain. Dad was drunk during his confession, still admissible in court. He told the officers on scene that he killed his wife in a fit of rage. He never admitted to the mis dismembering her, despite all the blood evidence. The bloody clothes were found on the kitchen floor. When asked how he disposed of her body, from his original confession to his dying words in a prison hospital, he always gave the same response. <laughs> You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Yesterday, I woke up on the rotted kitchen floor, having passed out drunk on my first bottle of the, the first, my first night back in 26 years. I immediately went out and got another bottle, just like Dad. Came back here to the scene of the crime, and the bottle and I opened up to our souls. Why didn't I try to save Mom? Did Dad do what I think he did with her body? Does the drawer really eat stuffing? Bills, letters, pens, and pencils. Flesh, bones, organs, and... After going mad with questions, the bottle I and I conducted an experiment. I took a pair of scissors I found, run from outside my vehicle registration from the car, and I put all three items in the drawer and closed it for a mere second before yanking the drawer back open. 
paper, scissors, and no rock. Dumbfounded, I examined the drawer. Then I closed the cabinet and opened again. Scissor, no paper. I closed and opened it, opened it a third time. Empty. Not to sound insensitive, given the subject matter, but I was excited because I proved mom right. The drawer does eat stuffing. It eats when it chews. It chews? Okay. It eats when it chews by being open and closed. If you have more than one thing in there, if you open and close that drawer, something's going to get chewed up. But there is only one item inside, and that item will be eaten. That's why the police never found mom's body. His dad cut her up to pieces and helped the drawer chew her up. It's hard to be so crude. I bet it started as cruel revenge. Sticking a part of her in the drawer. Must have been shocked when that part was dis- When that part disappeared. And maybe he put a second piece of her inside out of stubborn disbelief. When it happened again, I gather he saw that it is a means to hide the evidence of his crimes. So mom became stuffing. The drawer eats whatever you feed it, even if it's something dead. Call it supernatural. Call it divine. Call the drawer whatever you want, but it's a living thing. The magnitude of this extraordinary realization gave me a strange rush. I actually smiled for a moment, like Dad did when he saw that cash. And just like Dad, my mood quickly soured when I heard banging at the front door and a sound, Carol yelling. As I confess, Bear in mind, brother, that I had been drinking all day, and Karen had become the person I hated most in the world, post-dad's death to liver cancer. So when she tracked me down to our childhood home, I barged inside. I felt like a trapped animal under attack. She stormed in the kitchen, demanded that I sign the divorce paper she had in hand. Well, it's here that I wholeheartedly admit feeling a surge of alcohol fueled rage course through my veins as I wanted to, st to stuff those divorce papers in the drawer. Close it and make room for some more stuffing. Filled with anger, I moved towards her. And then I caught a corner of my eye from across the room. I turned to look and saw it clearly from the sunlight piercing through the dirty window. A blood stain on the counter. A mom stain. Um, I hugged Carol, signed the divorce papers, and asked her to tell the kids that I loved them. She left confused, but set gratified. I have never succumbed to violence, and I never will. I guess I'm not like that after all. It made me realize that I probably didn't need to drink like Dad did either. Invigorated, I grabbed the bottle and headed for the drawer. I slammed the bottle inside and shut it. I was drunk, mind you. My four fingers were inside the drawer. When I closed it. I felt a tap. Nothing born. I opened it. A drawer ate one of my fingers. The bottle was there. I saw three of my four digits. My middle finger was gone. There was no pain. The skin over the nub was smooth as if my finger had been removed surgically and healed over. The reason I didn't feel freak out was because I was pissed off about it. I wanted my finger back and I was drunk, so I did something stupid. I removed the bottle and stuck my whole hand inside. I shut the drawer on my hand with the desire to open it, and my fingers finger reattached. A slight tap near the base of my thumb was subtle, but proved significant the drawer considered my palm, thumb, and three remaining fingers as one stuffing. My hand was gone at the wrist. I stared in dis disbelief, the nub of my the on the end of my arm. There wasn't any pain, but I'm sure I was in shock as I stuffed my arm inside the drawer and yelled for it to displace, replace my hand. Right now, 
I drunkenly slammed the drawer close in my arm. Then I stood up. Yes. The drawer ate my arm. I used my other hand to feel the number of my shoulder played when my arm used to be connected. I remember laughing and feeling dizzy. And then for the second time since I arrived, I passed out on the kitchen floor. When I woke, when I awoke, there was a strange sensation with my missing limb. I could feel all of my fingers attached to my hand, which felt reattached to my arm. I'm not talking about phantom limbs. I'm saying that wherever my arm was, it was whole again. I could touch my missing fingers together or together. I could snap with my thumb and my middle finger, which was the first part of me to go. Now it's back in place. I felt my missing hand crawl around a strange floor. Then I bent my arm at the elbow, but the knob above my armpit, and my arm ends. The jar eats whatever you feed it, even if it's something alive. My revelation inclines me to believe that the jar doesn't care whether you're dead or alive or in pieces. The end result is that it puts you together again on the other side, wherever that is. It begs for the question, did mom get reconnected piece by piece? And if so, maybe she got put back together alive. Well, dear brother, that is what I intend to find out. First, I received this notebook, a pen from my car, and sat down on the kitchen counter. Then I called you on my cell, turned my phone off as I wrote all of this. I should try to be here shortly as I have no, I have no reason to think you're not coming. Try and save me from torching this place with me inside it. You always were the heroic one. And now, it's time for me to go one piece at a time. Excuse me. After all, some of me is already there. Wherever there is. The rest of me is catching up. That's all. While seated on the counter, I stuck one foot inside the drawer and closed it. I felt a mere tap and nothing more. I lifted my leg up and start, started at the ankle nook where my foot used to be. I wiggled my missing toes and feel them moving around somewhere, waiting for me. To say, it, to say it's been challenging would, have, would be an understatement. But I've, been mani I've managed to maneuver around well enough to help the drawer eat me. After I fed, fed it my other foot, I stuffed my legs in the drawer. One at a time. My legs were gone from the knees down. Then I kind of slid down into the drawer to my belly button. I used my only remaining hand to pull myself the drawer closed. I felt a pat on my lower body. But suddenly I was falling. Thankfully, my hand caught the edge of the sink and I was able to pull myself back onto the counter. I am half a man from stomach to head with arm, one arm to finish this letter and lower myself down into the drawer. Then I will stuff myself inside while the cabinet closed. Reuniting with the rest of me. Again. May I find you? Check. I remind you to check the floor for fingers in case I lose one closing the drawer. And if so, be a sport and toss them in, toss them in one at a time. I'd hate to be incomplete wherever I'm going. If I'm right and mom is there, I saw her you love her. Who knows? You might decide to come join us. Arthur. Wait. Th the brother replied. Alright. Here it goes. <laughs> Dear Arthur, thank you for writing this letter. I'm sorry that your final attempt didn't go as successfully as your I certainly hoped. Your hand was crawling around the floor when I entered the kitchen. I screamed and stomped on your, head, your hand several times. Sorry about that. I hope it didn't hurt you too bad. Wherever you are, I wonder if you were consciously controlling your hand when I grabbed hold of your shoe. My shoe was, was instinctually grasping me at, in survival mode. Either way, I threw your creepy hand in a drawer of all places. That's if the drawer wants us to feed it, though. No. Maybe it, has, it does have influence over the place and us. I closed the drawer and found this notebook lying on the counter. 
After reading it, I summoned the courage to open in the drawer again. I hope your hand found you well, my brother. And that you are whole. Since you confided in me, allow me to share you a secret I too have kept all these years. The heroics you mentioned. When I ran to the neighbors, I didn't go out my window. I snuck out the back door. But first, I crept to the kitchen doorway and saw Dad stuffing Mom inside the drawer, piece by piece. That's why I've never been able to discuss that day, regrettably, not even with you. And for the rest of my life, I've suffered nightmares of seeing Mom in some strange place where she has been put back together again, piece by piece. Except her reattached head and limbs are bloody and crooked, she's whole, but not alive as she reaches for me. I'd wake up screaming in my bed, I still do. I pray that you find Mom whole. She's the version you hoped for, not the one that haunts me. Last night, I had another nightmare. Mom was in that strange place, but for the first time, we were standing, standing right beside her, with crooked legs, both of you, but in pieces, not alive still reaching for me. My apologies for sharing such morbid vision, but I hope it explains why I dare not attempt to join you. After I feed this notebook to the drawer, I'm going to burn this place to the ground. Call it mystical. Call it magical. I don't care what you call this living abomination, because this letter is the last thing I'm ever going to eat. I hope this drawer chokes on it. Bye, brother. You know this. I love you too, Thomas. <laughs> well, there's that. I don't know if that's that scary though. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Who knows? But there you go. There's your horror story. Ish. <laughs> You found it scary. Interesting. The drawer that ate. And ate. And ate. Wouldn't you want to stuff your stuff in that drawer? I wouldn't. Not, at, not the way the brother explained it at the end there. Hmm. Uh. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Mm -mm. I never, I normally don't read horror stories or books or anything. Yeah, at least not this way, right? I remember back in school. Um, back when I was still in school, right? And they had to do me do those, uh, you know, with a popcorn reading. It was never like this. I did not read very well. In fact, I was always um. I read ahead. I always read ahead. And I was always, um, like, five pages ahead. Yeah, they were, people were kind of slow at reading. Now, even, mind you, eventually, the teachers found out that I read ahead. And just kind of stopped calling me for popcorn. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I normally I don't read stuff like, like so. Now, there's this one horror story that really, really messed me up as a kid, right? You guys ever heard of the, the ho kind of a horror story called The Girl with the Green Ribbon? You guys ever heard of that one? That one screwed me up so bad as a kid. Terrified me, actually. Be that one. That one's. Yeah, how long is it? It's not that long. Hey, okay. it's doable. <laughs> or I could read more creepy pastas too. Sure. Uh, let's see. Become lindered. Ben Drown, really? I put recommended and that's what they give me. 
Oh. Tails from the gas station sounds like a fun one. That's very true, yeah. <laughs> well then, I'm glad. I'm glad. Let's see. Tails from the gas station. Alright. We'll read the girl with the green ribbon around her neck. Next, right? Mm -hmm. But before, before we do that, um, let me turn on my lights. Oh, because <laughs> if it becomes dark, it's not gonna track. My camera's not gonna track me. So let me just turn on my lights real quick. I'll leave you guys with this face. Hold on. Don't go, I'll be back. I'm back. <laughs> My night is just right there, so. <laughs> I just don't want you guys seeing me, um. Ooh, excuse me. I have a panic attack, right? <laughs> Nacho knows what, I'm knows what I'm talking about. That panic attack is scary within itself. Almost as if something or someone is possessing my body, right? You want it? If you ever want to see it, all I have to do is cover the camera. Is it easy? What did I just see? Okay. Let's now begin. Ready? The girl with the green ribbon around her neck. <sighs> Let's see if it still messes me up as much as it does now. A long time ago, there lived a girl with a gr dark green ribbon tied around her neck. On her first day of school, the boy sitting behind her, who was named Jim, noticed it from behind her blonde hair. Why are you wearing that green ribbon? He asked the little girl. She looked at the crowd. Someday maybe I'll tell you, she said and turned away. A year later, they became best friends. And whilst they were eating lunch, Jim asked again, you wear that green ribbon. The little girl laughed awkwardly. Maybe I'll tell you another time. This is not fitting the mood. Okay. When they entered high school, Jim asked the girl out and soon became his girlfriend. He asked again as they were kissing. Now will you tell me why you wear that green ribbon? He pleaded with her. Um, maybe if we ever get married I'll tell you. She said, biting her lip. Ooh, spicy. Jim fell in love the, with the girl. And ten, ten years later, proposed. I'm not feeling that. Hold on. <laughs> let's, let's use this. Yes? The Resident Evil, know the song. Anyways, Jim fell in love with the girl, and ten years later he proposed. And, and then, and they got married. In bed their first night, the only thing his new wife wouldn't take off was her green ribbon. The green ribbon stays on. <laughs> hey, sorry. Um, please tell me why you wear that ribbon, Jim begged. If we ever have kids, I'll tell you, she replied, averting her gaze. They had two children, a boy and a girl. And then Jim asked again, Now, will you please, 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 tell me why you wear that green ribbon? His wife sighed and answered, Look, if you really love me, please, just drop it. One day, I promise, I will tell you why. 
Oh, Jim dropped it. Though he was dying to know, he just accepted the fact that his wife always wore a green ribbon around her neck. They grew old together. The woman became very sick. The doctor told Jim she was going to die soon. Jim sat by her bed for bedside for days, distraught, and then he finally said, Please, tell me now, why do you always wear that ribbon around your neck? In a croaky voice, his wife replied, Okay, I'll tell you. Take it off now. Jim reached for the ribbon and fumbled with fumbling figure fingers, pulled the bow loose, and her head fell off. That, that's it. <laughs> but as a child, that one really, really messed me up because, because I mean, I wanted to know why. I needed answers, but I didn't get it. I didn't get any of it. And yes, it was wholesome and everything that, that, you know, they got married, had children, but why did she have the green ribbon? Why did it hold her head? Was she born with it? Maybe she was dead all along. We'll never know. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Are you guys ready for tales at the, from the gas station? Mm. According to Nuclear Nachos, tales from the gas station is very good. There's part. There's a second part to this, apparently. <laughs> it was short and sweet, wasn't it? Yeah. But again, I still have questions. <laughs> but then again, little Jim, little Jim found love. So, what's it matter, right? <laughs> The ribbon stays on in bed, okay? Gosh. It doesn't matter. Hey, maybe she was hot. I don't know. <laughs> I've seen scary hot ghost people. And if you haven't, then you're crazy. Alright. This is an estimated. 75 minutes <laughs> 75 minutes of reading holy crap that's that's a long read uh, that's a long long story let me see he who wanders To this one 22 minutes yeah okay here it goes <laughs> don't worry nuclear nachos and i mean nothing by it i mean nothing by it <laughs> maybe we'll see if the story tales from the gas station for last I, let's see yeah, do i have time to read that oh i have time let me double check before i confirm that I I do not have time to read that today. Okay. We'll read a couple of smaller ones. We have two hours. We'll do two hours of reading, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Here it goes. He Who Wanders. Written by Simon Simo Simonia. <laughs> what a name. Alright. A mist, the scorching wind. The scorching wind of Andalusia. How it pours sunlight onto your face, toying with eyelashes. That flattening dry sand against cheeks and milling around hair. 
I miss the smell of the valley, the ripening softness of muscat fluff glistening in the afternoon breeze. From up here, I can see the house where we, where we grew up. I see white chapels tucked into grape orchids, like ponds scattered on a chessboard. I can see patches of asphalt on El Giardinito Road, hailing from the old town. Through dappled rocks, then warning, waning behind the horizon with erratic headlights, beat up trucks cruising along. One of the pit stops along Edge. <laughs> I can't say it. A Giardinito. The truck drivers stop to relieve themselves. Marks the starting point to this wavy tri trail. All covered in plotches of spindly grasses, stalks, and flax and sand. The trail is barely noticeable at first. Proof is, no one even cares to notice it. Why would truckers taking a break blitzingly care to check on a mucky trail leading to God knows where? But I do. And this is how I got up here, to the top of this hill, where I'm standing now. I've climbed all the way up here, so I can finally end all of it, and I'll end it all. All these years of vagrancy and feud, exile and fear. This is where it's all go come, going to come to an end. But, for now, I am enjoying the view of the valley of unfolding below. I'm sipping the air of what would be my final memory. It will show up soon. Always does. Like a shadow. He's been following me right on my footsteps. Always there. Behind me. There he is. This limping figure appears behind the sharp bend of El Jardinito. He looks up and sees me, then stops for a moment to catch his breath, and leans on his cane, as if assessing the remaining trajectory of his final, for his final stretch, then resumes his walk, or should I say, resumes his agonizing trudging. Years of endless chase took a toll on his body, no wonder. How long has he been chasing me? 10, 20, 30 years? He is slow. Methodologically metholo slow. But for once, I will not run. I will wait right here behind this rock. I will finally come face to face with him. This sharp, swift, swift knife blade I'm holding in my hand soon lands right through his neck bone. Yes, that's what I'm going to do. This ends here. The dead end of the sandy trail. Atop the hill overlooking the valley. While it's white chapels and musket orchids. While well, with this white chapels and musket orchids. Funny. After all these years, I still don't know the real name of my, name of my chaser. I always called them what Master Borge Borgs calls it, called him. He who wanders, he who wanders, listen, I will kill you. The Borg, the Borges, I idolized him when I was in college. Many did, but it was different. It was 1961. I was an average lazy learner at the Universal Universidad Laboro de Cordoba. <laughs> de Cordoba floating around from one semester to another with barely passable grades. I had very few friends and almost no interest. One can say I had an early form of an identity crisis. Besides chugging and any saddle, my only other passion mission was literature, Latin American literature. Borges and Neruda were at the forefront. One could only imagine my excitement when I saw a pamphlet hanging on the wall at the literature facility or faculty. Spaces were limited, but who cared? It was the man himself, Georges Louis Borges, 
coming to give us a lecture, followed by an open panel. Questions. Like a maniac, I rushed to, aud to the aud auditorium hours before the lecture. As the first in line, when the doors open, the, I got the front row seat. The auditorium was packed with jeweling chins of young self proclaimed tragedies awaiting the arrival of the Great One. There he was, the blind lord of li literature, walking right onto the stage with a cane and his loyal assistant right beat by his side, standing ovation. He nodded and made a thank you. Please be seated. Gesture. Then he began. The lecture was dedicated to Spanish writers. I could not distinctly recall if it was Cervantes or De Vega. It surely made no difference. Somehow, I managed to sit through his entire lecture, which lasted over three hours, and remembered nothing. He talked slowly and methodically, pouring honey into our ears, like Se Segovia's guitar, with his, with, the, with his absent eyesight fixed on the ceiling. And then, it happened. Something that caught me completely off guard. Before closing the day, George was about to take questions from his audience. Of course, I raised my hand. So did hundreds of other students. But Borges' assistant whispered something into his ears, which made him smile. It is an honor for me to be in front of an audience of young people, but our time is not infinite. He said with blind eyes still pinned to the far corner of the hall. <laughs> for that reason, I will randomly pick questions from five of you. I've never won any prizes or lotteries in my life. When I played poker or blackjack, I lost far more than I won. I knew my limitations, and that turned me into an amateur apath apathetic person, rarely trying to outdo oneself. And so, sitting li still with little ambition, I got used to that. Till that moment, I saw Borge pointing his finger in my direction. I came as nothing short of a shock. Me? Yes, young man. Senior Borge picked you. Step forward, introduce yourself, said his assistant. I did not know what to ask, so I quietly mumbled, muffled my full name, Fernandez, Fernandez Augusto Nav Navarro. Borge shifted his gray shaded pupils in my direction as a react to a sudden buzzing to a, of a fruit fly. Fernandez Augusto Navarro. Navarro, have I met you once before, young man? He asked. No, Senior Borge, I never had the honor. But you will. We will meet again, Senior Navarro. You and my you and I will meet again. But for right now, what is your question? The rest of the day was foggy. I don't remember I don't even remember what question. I asked. It must have been about him winning the Prix Prix International. I'm not sure, and maybe not important. No. Not important at all. The greatest writer in the history of mankind called me by name, and then that bizarre, unreal thing he said about us began again when? Nine years later in 1970. And there was. Somewhat promising journalist in one of London's somewhat scandalous tabloid newspapers. Every week, my name was featured on the second page, alongside with celebrity uh, a page alongside with celebrity chronicles and vile rumors. My paycheck was decent enough for a small studio flat by Manchester Square. After years of having been pent up by directionless studies, I could say I became something more than an average, or at least. That is what I believed. That day it was early October, arguably the best season in London. It began as usual. Uh, excuse me. I ate my cheek breakfast, consisting of two scrambled eggs, ham, toast, and dark roast coffee at Barry Moore's Diner, and I was ready for a pleasant walk to the office. It was shortly after 8 a.m. 
I was in no hurry. My route was the same as it was every day. Past the square, turn right on George Street, turn left there, another right on Melbourne. My thoughts that morning were all pre preoccupied with the piece I was working on. So I slowly, I was slowly making my way through the square. Something caught my eye, or rather, someone. At first, I did not pay much attention to him. No more than I did anybody else who idled the square that morning. Happy rascals with soiled hair laid playing guitar on every corner was a common theme in those days. London town was certainly no exception. But he was another one of those misunderstood love proclaimers sitting right behind the gated area of the square. Sticking, sticking out. A common hippie bum, as anyone may have thought. I thought so too, except this one had something that made my intestines churn. I didn't know what it was. But once I saw him, I felt the ir irresistible urge to instantly walk away and never see him again. The way he looked at me, that gloomy frown that made me think of a line from Oscar Wilde, the fellas got to swing. There certainly was something outerworldly about that fellow. His eyes, as if carved from a rock, below his forehead was mercilessly, mercilessly drilling thousands of tiny holes for me. I added a pace as I turned back one last time. I noticed him slowly walking towards me, past the gates of the square onto the street. I had no attention to screeching tires of, cor of con or honking cars walking right towards me. He's just a bum. No, he's not. Just another one of those unwashed hippies. No, no. Run, run, run. George Street was empty, like a post or bond quarters. I could hear his brisk footsteps. Or was it the dumping of my aroda against the chest? He was catching up. Run? Don't be silly. Yes, run. Or slowly as if you're trying not to, to not show your chaser. You're scared. No, not scared. But like in a hurry. Why am I running? Take him out with one punch. But it really wasn't about that. It was my first experience of that feeling, which I can only describe as some sort of primordial sense of fear. Dick. Dread. Unexplained sense of looming doom. An ache arching above you. Dark fear. Strength scythe. I ran. I ran faster than my feet could move. As I turned the corner on Thayer, I paused and looked back, fearing to see him right behind. Scrambled eggs, toast, dark roast coffee were about to make their way back up to my esophagus. Wiping the sweat off of my palms onto my pants, I bent forward in a protect protective position and looked around. At the windows of George Street, checking me out like a toddler, Witnessing, witnessing parent, a cowardly act. Whoever the man was, that incensed me into his uncontrollable panic. This uncontrollable panic. It was now God. Shame on you, Fernandez Augustine. I repeated to myself while making futile attempts to draw palpitation to subside. Shame on you. I mumbled, repeating that word. Mumbling turned into whistling. That was song by Magic Lanterns. Shame, shame, I whistled. Acting calm and self-composed, I sang without knowing words only to convert my mind to something else. I sang so others wouldn't notice me sh shaking. I climbed the stairs of my office building, three at a time, third floor. The familiar smell, a typography, typography? Oils calmed me down. Safe haven. Shame on you, Fernandez Augustine Navarro. Even now, I question myself whether my journey to madness began on that day, but was underway for many years. Madness that creeps in and recedes in tidal waves. That's how it usually happens. All I know is that an hour later, I was laughing at my little moment of weakness. Preposterous and rubbish. My thick 
illusion, Wang spoke to me. The idea of being fully checked out by specialists didn't cross my mind. I immediately thought of Dr. Patel and Cam Dental. He gave me a comfortable medical diagnosis, diagnosis, like a panic attack, and prescribed some white pills, I thought. Little did I know. That day had more surprises in store. The unnerving script, script development continued in a more eerie fashion when my boss marched to my desk with a pack of printed paper. No, Navarro, you are not going to see Dr. Patel in Camden Town, who will make a judgment call on your insanity. Instead, I'm going to do an article on George Louis Borges' new book. He's making his presentation today at the London Public Library. Blah, blah, blah. I forgot about the panic attack. The thrill of seeing Ma Master Borges again, nine years later. Surreal. Moments later, I was sitting in a cafe on my way to the London, London Public Library, scribbling all possible questions I should be asking him. I'll inform the Brody of the books. Forget it. I knew very well what I would ask. I paid the cab cab and galloped up, galloped up the marble stairs, leading to the hallway where ma the master was about to hold his new book presentation. I elbowed myself through the crowd of journalists to occupy the coveted front row spot. Quick inventory check, wallet, jack sack, along with omnipresent swift's knife. Second ticks, seconds ticked leisurely on my wristwatch. Four more minutes. Forget this morning's sickness. Forget the Victor Patel. Collect yourself, Dr. Fernandez Augustine. Navarro, that's your last name, isn't it? Yes, yes, Senior Borge, but how do you... Nine years ago, in Cor Cordoba, I told you we would meet again. Do you remember? I nodded rapidly, completely forgetting he couldn't see me. Stupid. Perhaps, continued Borge, it would be more prudent for us to speak privately after the conference. I invite you to have coffee over me. You like Colombian coffee, Mr. Navarro? I shall see you precisely at six o'clock at the address that my assistant will provide. His blind eyes were fixated at the top far corner of the hallway, far, far above the congested chunk pencil critics and odorous followers of his divine writing. The attention was now all on me, as revealed by hundreds of photo flashes from behind. Out of all the explaining that I would have to have to do tomorrow. Urge to know you. Are you friends? You're raised in Cordova. Do you know his illegitimate son? Back then, I did not know. Answers came later. Memory is a tricky animal. As I gave gaze over the valley, satiated my lungs with familiar smells, I could not think of anything specific. Vague and elusive memories of my childhood home. These orchids. These white chapels and the old town itself. Nothing but incomprehensible sensation. Somewhere down there, below the chest cage. I closed my eyes and let the sun twirl around. With tinted specks of mosaic light. I'm trying to focus without looking. At last, nothing comes to mind. been robbed of my memory. You. I cast my eyes at the trial, trail again. He's closing in. It's hard for him to walk upward. And yet, I see that determination in his eyes. In his tight grip of that wobbly walking stick. The way he per periodically stops to catch his breath and eyeball the remaining distance. I'm not going anywhere. Five, ten more minutes? Come and take me, old man, if you can. I almost see his facial expression under the heavily pronounced frontal lobe. The grin, and an expression that says, We'll see. Once I read an interview in the Morning Times. In it, in it Borch was portrayed, portrayed as extremely humble, humble and min minimalistic. His house was depicted as a perfectly organized space with easy access to everything. 
books on the shelf. Shelves. Judging from admiration, admiration of the columns, lots of them, were organized by the by theme and by title. Dictionaries of encyclopedias were grouped together in the same rack, so he so he could find them easily. Another article dated 1966. I read that Borges travels, or when Borges travels, and those travels were quite extensive. Carries a whole rack of books along, some of which may now have been read. Oh, not even read. When I entered his hotel room, that very rack book was the first thing that caught my eye. I stood perplexed at the multitude of titles, most unknown to me, when I heard the door swing, door swing wide open. There he was entering through the doorway with a leisurely cane swinging cane. Senor Navarro, how kind of you to visit this old man. Oh, sorry, yawning. <laughs> I took a step forward towards him, reduced some gibberish like that was all mine, but he half smiled and pointed, pointed his hand to the chair. You know, you quite enjoyed a chase of taste of Colombian, Colombian dirt. Borg sat down and leaned slightly backwards. Not releasing his cane. And you know the biggest advantage of being blind. There it is. He asked and, ans and, and answered immediately. I don't need light. So my utility bills are way low. <laughs> he laughed at his own joke. Going to be interrupted by assistant carrying a tray of aromatic coffee. Poured into two. Uh, I lost track. Two small porcelain cups. Amazing how the very idea of drinking coffee instantly changes your mood before you even take your first sip. As I was ready to go on a pre scripted monologue of expressing my gratitude and honor, or just jump right into the action. I will get right to it, Senor Navarro. Hello, Belia. You're kind of late, but we're still going to be going on, so don't you worry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anyways, Senor Navarro, about you being here, and about me rem remembering you, I know you have many questions. I will attempt to answer some. Some, but not all. When you leave this hotel, there will still be some questions that you will have to a find answers to on your own. He gently picked his cup up, uh, picked his cup of coffee, and with his hand somewhat shaking, took an artistic sip. Yes, I had questions. So many that my brain membranes were buzzing in bewilderment and disbelief. Here I was, sitting in a room with one of the greatest writers, who happened to mysteriously know my name and... Have you by any chance read my book? Read my the Book of Imaginary Beings? Asked the Borges. I have, many times. I read it in Spanish when it just came out. Very recently, I bought the English translation in some shabby bookstore off Oxford Circus. I read that book far too many times, but never in its entirety. Mostly starting on a random page, just as Borges had intended it to be consumed by his readers. You see, Sir Navarro, that book was, per perhaps still is, a nervous, a never-ending work in progress. This human imagination has no boundaries. I've included, included what I had researched over ten years ago, and then recently expanded and republished with more figments of collective human imagination. But the book is merely a small subset. In a way, the book writes itself. In some form, it's a labyrinth, an endless one, a living one, where every corner and every room is never the same. What I had always, I had always wanted, the book to reflect the labyrinth of our inner collective, some consciousness, the force that drives our mind to craft. For that reason, the creatures in my book are strictly fictional, mythical. Am I not boring you? Not at all. I understand, Sir Borch. He nodded, and wiped 
and whipped the coffee grin off his grin, right? Grind of his nose. That book, as its title implies, is all about imaginary beings. Tales, legends, folklore. But one thing that no one knows is that I had originally intended this book to include one more being. A being that goes by its Latin name, Equitus Est. It appeared and disappeared across many cultures, sometimes centuries apart. Very little is known, but what I found was indeed astonishing. First, this being is physically no different than an ordinary human. I say, is human in many ways. As I studied this entity, I became more and more agitated. I could not stop, like a madman that was trying to learn more and more. But very soon, the excitement turned into another feeling. Fear. Fear what, Sir Borges? Borges' eyesight shifted from the corner of the room straight on me, as if he could perfectly see me. Fear of what I had uncovered. That equitus equi equi est is not a myth at all. This sounds good, Dahlia. <laughs> I hope my reading isn't uh, putting you back to sleep. And also, good morning. <laughs> Good morning to you. He attempted to take another sip, but his hand started shaking, so he had to put the cup down, spilling some of it on a saucer and around the table. Pardon me, young man. I'm trying to maintain composure, but you have not tried the coffee. He said, wiping his mouth and forehead with a little handkerchief. He raised a small cup and took a sip. Where am I? Uh, there it is. Disregarding the aromatic, aromatic fumes of Colombian beans, drifting down my internal gorges. Pardon me, sir, but are you saying an imaginary being called Quitus Est was not imaginary? Is that why you decided not to include him in your book of, imag of imaginary beings? Only in part. Here came from the realization of what it would mean for mankind to know about his existence, you see. It's no secret that we are all well aware of our eventual demise. We all die. But imagine what would happen if we st stared right into the face of death every single day in our lives and knew that the time that was left for us in this world. Death, not as vague, not as a vague concept portrayed by middle-aged artists, not as a folk tale or of a grim reaper, but the living identity that stalks you and walks around showing you a ticking clock around every uh, ticking clock counting down minutes. Seconds. Getting closer to you with every second. Trying to grab your hand. Running from death is worse than death itself. Took a deep breath and closed his eyes. But I shall talk no more. Allow me to give you my scribbles from years ago. These are unedited in the raw format. So please pardon the poor language. It's right there. In the drawer. You will find a folder with a yellow piece of paper. Read it out loud while my right body attempts to catch a breath. I opened the drawer as he instructed, found a yellow piece of cursive handwritings, carved in Spanish with some Latin phrases. The scribbles were short, less than a page long with marks and scratches, but most of this was very dis much decipherable. He must have written this himself, left blind, I thought. What caused him to do that and not dedicate to his assistant? I unfolded the paper and began reading. Quartus est. It said that one shall not know, but its own ways and sometimes in times of demise. The imminent passing is only felt by those who are either terminally ill, and even so, they don't possess the being other than the knowledge of when and where or by death row inmates, waiting the exact day and time of their execution. Such lack of knowledge. Cor choruses us to exist. 
Oh boy, there's still a lot more in the story. Exist. Some Sumerians believed it was a certain deity. But where deity was scratched in the place of demon of death, embodied in human flesh and bones, which again was scratched and replaced with entity, whose sole role is to stalk its victims, inform them of how much time they have left to live. For the ancient book of dead, which was discovered as a set of clay tablets, typically burned in books. Only those who are luminous can see their di deity again crossed out twice, in place of demon and an entity. The luminous ones are thought to be either people with high spiritual powers or vice versa. The cursed ones condemned by priests, the reference briefly reappears in some Egyptian manuscript, but in later writings, it is replaced by Anubis or in rare occurrences, of course. Sorry, I lost my... I lost my point of focus there. Uh, however, the la ra la la latter rare findings during Dark Ages referring to him as as this quite dismissed. The only depiction of Quietus S was that of an ordinary human standing next to a sun clock, which was used to measure the time the chosen one had left to live. From time to time, Quietus S stalks the chosen one, and when cornered, moves hand of the clock towards the short or to for shorten the lifetime. If it, the chosen one cannot escape, then his time eventually runs out. The very last reference. Found in Mr. Navarro, like enough, Mr. Navarro, you understand the idea here. Now, on to the main question why are you here? He drew closer in a dull shadow. Uh, uh, anyways, he drew closer, a dull shadow from a lamp cut through his elongated forehead. White is Estes. Est is an eternal wanderer who is always with us. To tie the timekeeper who sits at the edge of the stage with a ticking watch on his wrist. The greatest gift given to mankind and its inability to see him. When I lost sight, the blindness was a blessing in disguise. But one does not require eyes to see the wanderer. But eyes cannot see, just cannot hear. Well, the uh, ears can hear, oh, oops. <laughs> ears can hear and skin can feel. I hear him, I feel him. You are here, Mr. Navarro. As you and I are the luminous ones. Borges paused and asked me with a trembling voice. <laughs> Mr. Navarro, you saw him too, didn't you? Cold shivers had been accumulating in my lower back. Rushed up my spinal cord, and millions of explosions. Nausea formed an, a massive ball of air in my throat, and for a moment, I struggled to breathe. Desperately trying to seize the thumping inside, I pushed words out. I saw him today. How do you get used to the notion of being a passerby on this earth? Ordinary humans do not have to get used to that. We have that built-in protect protection layer that safely cork in our brain membranes that separates the realization of being mortal from flooding down upon us. It allows us to breathe air, the air, and lets us exhibit this extraordinary yet sacred carelessness. A mental block that denies the laws of life on a primitive emotional level. Even for the ke keenest scholars, the indecipherable tetra- Gametron, Gametron, is shown to us in, the ver in every step we take, in every cup of Colombian coffee we sip, in every word of wisdom that we collect, collect from books. Every second we bypass the sinister TikTok and hear the name of the god being whispered into our ears. And yet, here we are. Oh, wait. And yet, humans, 
turned around and whispered, Whistle, shame, shame, deceiving her own cognizance. And that, as Senior Borges called it, a true blessing. Those who possess the name of the divine being are doomed. Knowledge is madness. Knowledge is in existence. Knowledge of death is worse than death. He sat in his hotel room till early, early morning. The two luminous and doomed souls, a casual exchange of words, was amplified by the ticking of the clock. It was dawning when I noticed, or just nodding in his sleep. His left hand was rest, still resting on the cane, and his pupils, pupils shuffling behind shut eyelids. Borge was dreaming, so must have I. As, as I was ex exiting the foyer of the hotel, I hid behind a column and looked around the street. It was empty. Big light of street lamps drew strange crossbeams and pavements. Early October leaves were crying, gyring in close circles, rain uh, like witches around the fire. I was looking around, hoping to not see him. He wasn't there, but he was. I felt his presence not very far from me. Muscat orchids, they resonate inside. Uh, like echoes of guitar string heard from a deep alcove. But nothing but killer comes to mind. I'm trying to fo shift focused from one object to another. My no man memory is lost in endless labyrinths. You took my memories away from me, didn't you? Wait, mortal. Wait, mortal. Wait five more minutes and you will know the answer. Come here in my brain. He's talking to me now. I don't know how long the uphill, uphill walk is wearing him out. But what are pain and tiredness when you're crossing the finish line? As Borges warned me, do not ever come close to him. Do not look him straight in the eyes. He will always be near. His watch will, will be ticking. Attempts to catch on, run. But he will forever, ever follow. In a way, it will be like a shadow of you. I ran. He wondered, and he wandered. I evaded, he followed. Came too, cl too close to me in my room, hotel room, the second day after my long night in Borges' quarters. The fool in me was still, still thought that this escaping it from him. It's as easy as moving from a new flat, checking into a hotel. So, I did just that. It was some shab a hotel minutes from my work, where I decided to spend a few nights just to think things through. That evening, I remember every, <clears throat> every minute of it. it was my first face-to-face -face encounter of him. My room, B6, was on the basement level. Oof. As I stumbled through the hotel, dark hotel corridor, trying to find the key to my room, I felt his presence. But, my ignorant foolishness, dismissed all mental warnings, and turned the keys. As the door hinge squeaked, I took my first step into the hotel room. The street level window was casting two thick, Yellow streaks of light on the corporate floor. I smelled dust and spider webs. He was in my room, sitting on the edge of the bed with a rope in his hand. Then white blanket was covering his head, like a shroud around a statue. I stood in a stupor like a paralyzed insect. An avalanche of sweat gushed from every pore of my body. I hadn't twisted behind my back. I was feverishly trying to twist the doorknob. He got up from bed when I in bed with a groan took a step towards me. And too sweaty to turn the knob. Open it. Open it. He grabbed my wrist. Open. Run. The stretched toward of the hotel basement flash like random shots of a silent moon. Run. B5, B2, B1. Run. Staircases. Cases. Up. Uh, uh. Exit. Run. Your time is coming. Fernandez Augustin Navarro. 
a whisper crawled into my ears. Coming. It's the wind. I ran until my legs gave in. I fell down somewhere in the outskirts of the town, passing out in an alley amidst the rubbish till sun up. My madness had begun. In the following days of my first face-to-face -face encounter of Great Righteous Est, I moved out of my London apartment. I had some savings, enough to tramp down to town, enough to tramp town to town, content continent to continent, doing temp jobs here and there. Sometimes sleeping on the streets, he was right behind me. Even if I didn't see him for a month, I knew he would soon catch on. It would be only a matter of time for him to pop up somewhere. On the opposite side of the street, the next car over on the subway. Were madly prying through the shutters of windows in the house across. My attempts to speak to Bur Borge was futile. How does the blind master live with his curse? I wondered. How does he manage to evade the sinister follower? I had questions, far more than I had anticipated. The senior Forge was already on the other side of the globe. I wrote him letters, he never replied. I had calling hotels he where he stayed. Unavailable. The books that he wrote, I bought all of them. Attempts to find hidden meanings. What if he had sick messages from me inside his writing? San, the San, like the Brody's report. Brody? I searched his earlier writings, analyzed every word, pointless, futile. Until 1983, Shakespeare, Shakespeare's memory is my notebook. It turned out to be. It was somewhere in Eastern Europe when I, I bought the book. Immediately beginning my scrumptious, scrumptious study, letter by letter, page by page, sign by sign, every punctuation sign. And that's when I found it. The answer. The door was. The answer was, was the, door, the story itself. A story that did not require much study or or de decryption. All I had to do was read it. I knew I had to come face to face with Quintus Est, like Forge did, but not before having to do the life of an exile. That's what Borge had intended me to do. Such was his final word, his final and only message to me, embodied within his last story. A story write, written for the public, but intended for my eyes only. Story the story was that the protagonist receives memories of Shakespeare, memories that overwhelm him, overpowering his own, memories that belong to another man. In a way, it will be like a shadow to you. What just told me that night, slowly but surely, the shadow was becoming me. That's why I can only vaguely remember you, my childhood home, him or me. No more running. It ends here. Or is he on this long? Oh my gosh. That's still so much left. Uh, okay. A few, few more minutes. I say my, to myself as I look at the watch. There he is. He is out of breath, beaten, tired, and bent by the weight of his own arid body. One last push, old man, and we will meet. Behind, behind the rock, his footsteps on gravel and sand. I can tell them many other footsteps in the world. His breathing, wheezing and crackling. I am counting to five. He knows where I am at. I am. He's too tired. He's too tired to take that last step. Let me take that step for you. I am staring at his face, wrinkled like the leaves of, of an ancient scroll. Time's up, greatest est. I am telling him. He's not fighting back. The, my swiss blade finds a comfy spot below his Adam's ap apple. I'm going to finish him now. Something sounds are coming out of his flabby throat. What are you trying to tell me, old man? Let me hear your last words. I'm easing the pleasure, the, pre the, pre the pressure to let him talk. 
the sounds that come out? They come out, not words, but laughter. You, you are confused, he says. You got it all wrong. Let me, let me help you understand. I'm letting him sit up. He's coughing with blood. But one wrong move and he's dead. He wipes the blood off his lips and nods in understanding. All my life I have followed you, he begins slowly. The miracle I have come this far and never slow. Ever since I left, I left Cordoba. I was a ticking time bomb. I was diagnosed as suicidal. Doctor after doctor. Therapy specialist. Prescription yoga. I've tried them all. Some helped for a while. And the disease subsided. But then trolled back with a new, stronger wave. It's this disease that nests here. And he points to his head, forcing me to look for a way to end my own life. It all began in London on that morning when I was sitting at the bench in the middle of that square, feeling the disease gnawing on my brain. My first attempt was in that hotel, room B6. I sat on the bed in that dark room for hours, a rope in my hand and a blanket over my head. Death opened the door and stood above me in the darkness of the room. Oh, I wanted my pain to end. But it was not meant to be. Not then, not there. I had to live on. Ever since that day. There was a cat and a mouse game between us. I chased death and death would always slip away. Until now. He pauses, rubbing his flabby neck. Then points his finger down the valley and continues. I was born in that house. I remember every moment of my childhood. My parents, my toys, my school. I remember playing hide and seek with my cousins in the scat gardens and dozing off the Sunday clergy at White Chapel. I remember eastern rugs being washed on the street and the smell of grapes. My name? It's Nandis August Navarre. And you, you have no true name. They call you greatest est, the one who wanders. Elements of scorching infernos have been ignited all over me. The fire sets off inside my eyelids, spreading all, spreading over to all facial pores and trickling down my body. Lies, imbecile lies! I roar. Look at me, he says. I'm an old man, and you? Still young and strong as you will always be, if not aged, but think more. But do you remember your childhood? Shakespearean mem memories of random sounds, smells are all you have gained from me. Master Borge knew who you were. He cracked you. Then he tricked you. He made you think you were me. That was his way of evading you. By not revealing you, the truth, you not revealing you the truth until his final breath. Final book. Final story. You're the one who wanders. Those memories you have? Those are my memories. Now that I have told you who, I, who you really are, you must finally finish me. I have heard enough of his fibs. I am throwing my knife away. I shall not require any blades to finish him. With hands clenched around his thin neck, I am strangling him. I hear squeal, squeal at the grip tightness. I feel the crackling of neck bones between my thumbs. I see him gulping the air in warm convulsions. He looks peaceful. I sit on his chest and watch his last breath, up by the wind, carried down to the valley to the gardens, passing by the white chapel, the house where he grew up. The scorching, the scorching wind of Andalusia is pouring sunlight onto his face, pouring with eyelashes, pounding his cheeks and gyring through hair. He must have sm missed the smell of the valley, the ripening softness of muscat glistening in the air. I'm rewinding my wristwatch and walking downhill along the wavy trail. trail. My thumb's still sore from killing. Taking small steps now, step side sideways. Once I reach Eldar Jardinita Road, 
Who up on the first bus? Up there, we'll travel west or north. Destination will never matter. Anywhere is where the road takes me. Me. The one who wanders. That's the end of that story. I hope you guys enjoyed. Mm. I hope you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> that one for sure killed killed my girl. <laughs> Glad you guys are relaxed and you know kind of a nice game. In that game. Oh, blah 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 blah. Having a nice night or day. <laughs> oh, but we're not done yet. I'm not, I'm not done yet. In fact, I will read you two more stories. Yep. Not, no more horror stories, though. No more horror stories. Because they are long. <laughs> they are very, very long. Instead, I will read you this book. Let's see how long it is. It could be worse. Instead, I will read you the Hold on. Let me find it. There, there it is. Oh, perfect. Hmm. Maybe they don't have it. Then I won't read that book. Dad, we will read this one. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's not the one I rem remember. All right. This one is called "If You Give a Mouse a Cookie" by Laura Joff, Joffy Numeroff. An illustrated by. I well, guess you guys can't see the illustrations. If you give, you give a mouse a cookie, and the mouse will ask you for a glass of milk. If you, when you give the mouse the milk, it will ask you for a straw. When the mouse is finished, she will ask for a napkin. The mouse will want to look in a mirror to see if he has a milk mustache. It's a cute story. When the mouse looks in the mirror, the mouse will see his hair needs a trim. After the mouse trims his hair, the mouse will want a broom. The mouse might sweep every room in the house. Might. The mouse will then want to take a nap. You will have to find him a little box, blanket, and a pillow. The mouse will take himself will make himself comfortable and ask you to read a story. As we are, he will ask you to, he will ask to see the picture and will want to draw. The mouse will draw with crayons and paper. When the picture is finished, the mouse will want to sign his name with a pen. The mouse will want to hang his picture in the refrigerator, so the mouse will ask for tape. <laughs> Silly mouse. The mouse will hang up his picture and look at it. The mouse will remember that he is thirsty and ask for a glass of milk. But the glass of milk, he will want a cookie. The end. So, <laughs> just remember if you give a mouse a cookie. The end. <laughs> There's that book. 
such an old and silly book. Hmm. All right. Let's move on to the last book of the night. Ready? The last book of the night is The Cat and the Hat. Who sure knows a lot about that? <laughs> the sun did not shine. It was too wet to play. So we sat in the house all that cold, cold, wet day. I sat there with Sally. We sat there, we too. I said, Oh, I wish we had something to do. Too wet to go out and too cold to play ball. So we sat in the house. We did nothing at all. So we, so all we could do was sit, 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 sit. And we did not like it. Not one little bit. Bump. And then something went bump. But that bump made us jump. We looked. Then we saw him step on the mat. We looked and we saw him. The cat in the hat. And he said to us, Why do you sit there like that? I know it is wet and the sun is not sunny. Can have lots of good fun. That is funny. I know some good games we could play, said the cat. I know some good tricks, said the cat and the hat. A lot of good tricks I will show them to you. Your mother will not mind at all if I do. And Sally and I did not know what to say. Mother was out of the house for today. But our fish said, no, no. Make that cat go away. Tell your cat. Tell that cat in the hat, you do not want to play. He should not be here, he should not be about, he should not be here. Your mother, mother is out. Now, now, have no fear, have no fear, said the cat. My tricks are not bad, said the cat in the hat. Why, we can have fun, lots of fun if you wish. The game that I called up, up with fish. Put me down, said the fish. This is no fun at all. Put me down, said the fish. I do not wish to fall. Have no fear, said the cat. I will not let you fall. I will hold you high as I stand on a ball. With the book on one hand and a cup on my hat. But that is not all I can do, said the cat. Look at me, look at me now, said the cat. With a cup and a cake on the top of my hat. With all the two books, I can hold up the fish and a little toy ship with some milk on a dish. Look, I can hop up and down on the ball, but that is not all. Oh no, that is not all. Look at me, look at me, look at me now. It is fun to have to, to have fun, but you have to know how. I can hold up the cup and milk and a cake. I can hold these books, the fish on a rake. I can hold the toy ship and the little toy man. And look, with my tail, I can hold a red fan. I can fan with the fan and hop. And I, as I hop on the paw, but that is not all. Oh no, that is not all. And that is when, that is what the cat said that he fell on his head. He came down the bump, up there on the ball, and Sally and I saw. And Sally and I, we saw all the things fall. And our fish came down too, we fell in a pond. He said, do I like this? No, I do not. This is not a good game, said our fish, I see it. I know I do not like it, I not one bit. Now look what you did, said, said the fish to the cat. Now look at this house, look at this, look at that. You, you sank our toy ship, sank it deep in the cake. You shook up our house and you bent our new rake. You should not be here, our mother is out. You should get out of this house, said the fish in a pot. But I like it here, oh I like it a lot, said the cat in the hat. The pool in the pot, the fish in the pot. It will not go away, I do not wish to go. And so, the cat in the hat. And so, said the cat in the hat. So, so, so. I will show you another good, good game that I know. And then, the, he ran out. And then, fast as the fox, the cat in the hat came back with a box. Big red wood box was shut with a hook. I like this trick, said the cat. Take a look. And he got it from the got up on top with the tip of his hat. He called his cape from the box, said the cat. In this box are two things I will show you now. You will like these two things, said the cat with a bow. I will pick up the book and will see something new. Two things, and I called them thing one and thing two. 
These things will not bite you. You ought to have fun. Then out of the box came thing two and thing one. They ran to us fast. They said, how do you do? Would you like to shake hands with thing one and thing two? And Sally and I did not know what to do, so we had to shake hands with thing one and thing two. We shook their hands, but our fish said no, no. And those things should not be in this house. Make them go. They should not be here when your mother is out. Put them out. Put them out, said a fish in a pot. Fish does not rhyme. Have no fear, little fish, said the cat in the hat. These things are good things, and he gave them a pat. They are tame, oh so tame. You will have to... They have come here to play. They will give you some fun on this wet, wet day. Now oh, here is a game they like to... They like, said the cat. I like to fly kites, said the cat, cat in the hat. No, not in this house, said the fish in the pot. They should not fly kites in the house. They should not... Not... All the things they will pump, all the things they will hit. Oh, I do not like it. Not one little bit. Then Sally and I saw them run down the hall. We saw those two things. Bump their crates on the wall. Bump, bump, bump. Bump down the hall, all in the hall. Thing one and thing two. Thing two and thing one, they ran up. They ran down. On the string of one kite, we saw Mother's new gown. Her gown with the dots that are pink, white, and red. And we saw one kite bump on the bed of her head. <laughs> then those things ran about with big bumps, jumps, and kicks, pops, and big thumps, and all kinds of bad tricks. And I said, We did not like the way they play. I wonder if could see this. Oh, what would she say? And then our fish said, Look, look. And our fish said, With fear, your mother is on her way home. You hear? Oh, what will she do to us? What will she say? Oh, she would not like it to find us this way. Do so, do something faster, said the fish. Do you hear? I saw her, your mother. Your mother is near. So, as fast as you can, think of something to do. You have to get rid of thing one and thing two. But as fast as I could, I went after my net and I said with my net, I can get them with that. Get them, I bet. I bet with my net, I can get those things yet. Then I let, let my net, let, let down my net. It came down with the plot. Then I had them at last. Those two things had to stop. Then I said to the cat, Now you do as I say. You pack those things and you take them away. Oh dear, said the cat. You did not like our game. Oh dear, what a shame, what a shame, what a shame. That is good, said the fish. He has gone away. Yes, but your mother will come. She will find this big mess. And this mess is so big. So deep and so tall, I cannot pick it up. There is no way at all. Then he shut up the things in the box with the hook. The cat went away with a sad kind of look. And then, he was back in the house. Why the cat? Have no fear of this mess, said the cat in the hat. I always pick up my playthings and so, I will show you another good trick that I know. When we saw pick up all the things that were done, picked up the cake and a rake and a gown. Milk and a string and a books and a dish and a fan and a cup and a ship and a fish. And he put them away, then he said, That is son. And then he was gone with the tip of his hat. And a mother came too, came in, and said to the two of us, Do you have any fun? Tell me, what did you do? And Sally and I did not know what to say. Should we tell her the things that went on there that day? Should we tell her to her? Now, what should we do? Well, what do you do if your mother asks you? <laughs> well, there's that story. That silly, silly story. <laughs> yeah. Okay, my voice is dying. My voice is dying, but can hang out for a bit and chat. Let's go back to the actual chatting that that begin. Muted. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed my reading today. Um, a lot more talking than I usually do in, in a single stream. A lot more than usual, yes. So, 
definitely killed my voice there. But, you know, I had fun. I had fun and that's all that mattered. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> that's good to hear. Mm. Now, if, if you just want to ask me anything, ask me anything. Um, do so now, or hold for peace until tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> mm -mm. And tomorrow, we'll be right back on that Final Fantasy VII grind. Mm. Enjoy some nice story there, too. Yes, yes. Yeah, no problem. I enjoy reading to you guys. Well, this might not happen as often as you think, right? Mm -mm -mm. Because next week, I've got this crazy plan and... I, I, I guess crazy to me, but this crazy plan, I know I won't like it, but I want to do it. <laughs> so, the idea is to ask VTubers, hey, I'm going to draw you guys in five minutes tops, right? Put your reference sheet down, put the name down, put it all in a folder, labeled by your name, during all the all the years in a wheel, and I would draw X amount in this day in five five minutes per, right? <laughs> I thought that's I thought this idea would be fun, but maybe like again, like I said, maybe I'll regret this. <laughs> maybe I will regret this. Who knows, right? Who knows? I'll sit on it. Sit on it. Don't hold me to that. Okay. Don't hold me to that. I'll sit on the idea. And my voice will be fine. 90% <laughs> of my day, I don't really talk. So, this is uh, the only exception. Right? The only exception in the time I talk. Mm -mm. So, yeah. Let's see. You guys want to raid into anyone? Or do you guys want me to just end the stream? Because I can raid into uh, two people right now. <laughs> I can send you into complete and other other chaos, or I can send you to something maybe a little more tame. Yes. What, what, what do you guys want? Huh? <laughs> I, I like both of them either way. So, which one do you guys want? Chaos or tame? Tame. Okay. Tame. It is. Mm -mm. Then we will go raid Miss Clovette. Now again, like I said, I don't have a raid message, so we gotta do a Zatidan and um, <laughs> plan that out sometime, right? Mm -mm. But maybe we'll wait until I have uh, until I have emotes. I don't know, but she does know me by name. But there is that. <laughs> All right. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that story time. Actual story time this time. <laughs> and let's see. The message of the day is uh What is the message of the day today? Don't forget to send close friends um a message today, right? Mm -hmm. Don't forget to send your close friend a message message today. Alright? Alright, do it that as you will. And as always. Until next time, guys. See you guys later on. Up tomorrow, Tokyo. Okay. Bye bye. Ah. Uh, what do I want to do this? Ah. Uh,